lid on that before I knock it over. Hi, my name's Matt, welcome back to the shop. And a lot of uh, comments and the popularity of certain videos um, has kind of highlighted that the fact that people are interested in alternate engines, they're interested in how the design works, how you get around these ideas. You know, there's a lot of people sending me links to omnivore engines and opposed pistons, the Opoc and the Duke engine, and so on and so forth. So, what I wanted to talk about. I've had to write this down so I don't get lost. What I want to talk about is how you go from just um, the beginning to the end to mass production. So the first thing you start off with is you start off with an idea. So you start off with an idea, you go, and what we're, I'm going to actually use an example. <coughs> we'll use supercharge, a supercharged and a turbocharged engine. Um, basically you want to do both. So you you know you have the idea initially, which is well, hang about. Turbos have lag, and superchargers don't. But the shortfall of superchargers is that they work quite efficiently and quite well at low speeds, but high speeds their inefficiencies grow. Where turbos are better at higher speeds and more efficient at higher speeds. So you've got a crossover there. <coughs> And yes, I know before people start sending me links and stuff, yes, this has done, been, been done quite a lot in the past where they've had a turbo and a supercharger system that cross over. Um, so the first thing you want to do is you actually come out with the concept. So that's the first thing you do. You come out with the actual concept of how you are going to do it. How are you going to make this work? All the piping and stuff, you know, you want to put that there, that there, and you just basically work out what should go where in a very simple manner. Um, and off the back of that you need to work out what parts you need, you need to work out uh, volumes and stuff like that, you know, what size of these parts you need and stuff like that. And then obviously off the back of that comes the arrangement, how are you going to put it all together, etc. Is there anything that's a stopping block straight away? After you've done that you do a analysis. So you do a analysis and what you do is you um, <coughs> try to work out if it's at all possible in the first place. Is there a big stopping block in your way? And off the back of this, generally you do a lot of physics, a lot of calculations and stuff like that. Um, you know, you work out thermal efficiencies and uh, you know volumetric efficiencies, uh, heat saturation, heat dissipation, all these kind of things off the back of that. Um, the next thing you want to do then is also have a, uh, a comparison. You want to have something to compa compare it against. You can work out all these calculations um, of numbers and stuff. Uh, calculations. Let me get that right. Oh, T, idiot. You can work out all these calculations and stuff, but you need to have something to compare it to, because obviously your idea is to make. Uh, to fill in the shortfalls and the pitfalls or whatever or the um, the cons of a design that's already out there so you basically work out how you can uh, you work out all the uh, numbers and stuff of an engine that you are trying to you know supersede you're trying to replace this you're trying to make something better and to do that you need some kind of comparison and that's where in your analysis you start working out uh, your comparison and stuff like that so the next thing you do after that is you do a, what we call a pop a pop design which is, um, POP basically stands for proof of principle. You come out with a design, just so you CAD it, you can draw it, stuff like that, but now you're being a bit more, um, you're actually fleshing it out more, you know, you're putting nuts and bolts and screws in and bearings and can these bear, you know, is this the right bearing for that and so on and so forth. And then off, when you've got this kind of design, a POP kind of design, you can start to work out um, you know, actual physical dimensions. So off the back of this comes dimensions, um, materials, uh, you know, stuff like that. Materials, what you're going to put where, how big is it going to be, um, stuff like that. You're kind of starting to define exactly what it should be. Although your pop design, your proof of principle, is just to prove to yourself that this thing is going to work full stop. Generally we call this the prototype, 
Um, now, if this pot design fails, you do an FA. So that's a failure analysis. If something goes wrong, you take it apart and you look where it's failing. Are the bearings failing? Is it getting enough oil? Uh, did these bolts stretch and make everything go out of whack? Um, uh, you know, is this not a strong enough belt or is there not enough tension in the belt if you're trying to drive a supercharger or something like that? And then usually what you do is you can go to a POP2, a POP2 design where basically you um, learn from maybe possibly your failure analysis, stuff like that, and you make uh, modifications. You know, you change your design based on them failures if there were any. Um, after that, or you can go straight to that from this one, or you can go straight to your pop two, is you do um, you do your optimization. So now you've got a, 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 a prototype, a pop one, you know, you've got your um, proof of principle design. Now what you do is you optimize this. I don't need that many bolts, or that bolt can share that hole, um, this needs strengthening, blah, 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 blah. Oh, we can actually get more volumetric, volumetric efficiency if we just changed the bore to stroke ratio or for our supercharger, you know, if we actually gear it to a different gear, we'll actually get just a bit better um, performance and all the rest of it. And all of this is obviously based around doing some kind of testing. Um, that's how you optimise, is generally through testing. After you've done that, um, what you then want to do, and this is kind of a bit muddy because it depends what the design is, um, but you can either do uh, an MP design, which is a mass production design. Um, this, you know, it's okay having someone CNC, five axis CNC machine you out this really intricate part, but in mass production, you don't want to be doing that, you want to be casting things. So you go off from your original uh, POP1 or POP2 or something like that, you go away from your prototype which has very specific parts that are made to do exactly that. Now you have to start considering um, the mass production way of doing it, you know, and then on the back of that, I'm running out of room here, you do a tolerance analysis. So a tolerance analysis is if we build these parts and we are stamping these parts out, stamping them out of steel or we are casting them, what is the variation we are going to get from the man, you know, from manufacturing processes because they're going to be cheap, quick and dirty kind of thing. What are the tolerances we are going to get from that? You know, if we're drilling holes and stuff like that, what's the variation of that hole size on the back of 100,000 runs? And generally you can do a Monte Carlo analysis or something like that, which is basically um, just taking the variables and repeating them thousands and thousands of times, and your tolerance analysis will tell you how much you're deviating. Now, this is important because just say if you made something like you know this gasket and it needed to be uh, you know 0.2 of a millimeter thick, 200 microns thick, uh, when we actually stamp this part out out of the material. And when we put these three layers together, what is the actual measurement? You know, what is it above and under? Is it bang on 200 microns every single time? And if so, just say if this went from, just say if this went from, we want it to be um, 0.2 of a millimeter, and we have it, sometimes it's plus, it's 0.210, and minus, sometimes it's 1.96. Does this affect our design? How much would this affect our performance? How much would this affect its functionality? You know, and that tolerance analysis gives you a good idea. And then what you do is usually you apply a pass-fail rate to it. So you apply a pass-fail rate, and if you want the engine to produce this much power, how much would this deviation affect that from um, unit to unit to batch to batch? So then you do a tolerance, a tolerance analysis and make sure that what you are trying to produce is what you want from that. And then eventually what you do is you come in here and you design. Based on that, you you make a mass production design. So off the back of this tolerance analysis and everything else you've learned and from the optimization and stuff like that, what are we actually going to build? So let me put it this way. 
and Formula One and MotoGP they make the you know the precision parts just for them engines. They want a, a, a con rod that's exactly this, that weighs exactly this amount. The deviation between each con rod, we want it to be nothing. We want them all to be exactly the same. So you can fickle, you know, you can build a thousand and chuck away 900 and you're just left with a hundred left. You pick the best of the bunch. Where with mass production, you don't want to be doing that. Your yield would be terrible. So sometimes you have to change your design based on your tolerance analysis. Once you've all done that, um, the next thing you would do is you have your actual mass production design and you start making small runs from the mass production and then you test them. So you test them, you measure them, you do failure analysis if there is any failures, you do another tolerance analysis if you need to, um, stuff like that. And eventually once you've passed all this, you end up back here, which is production. So something goes into mass production. So the R1 engine or something like that will end up in mass production. I needed the book because I wanted to make sure I had enough space. <laughs> Otherwise, I just end up going mental. Um, so one of the things that I haven't included in this is cost. The reason why I haven't included cost in this is because cost could be anywhere. Cost could affect you here. You know, um, on your original concept, well, we have to make everything out of diamond. Well, forget that. Then we can't do that. On your pop design, you start considering cost here. How much are these things going to cost? Um, when you start doing your optimization, that's another time when cost comes into it. Uh, when you do your mass production, totally cost comes into it because we want to see how much this is going to cost and is it viable. And then we always go back with our cost back to our comparison, our analysis, where we look at. What we're com you know what we're competing against the engine might produce 10 percent more horsepower but it costs three times as much as the engine that you're trying to be so that's a basic overview and this is where and this is this is where the cost of manufacturing design and manufacturing engines and any kind of invention in the sense this is where the cost comes from this is what um, engineers, this is what we all get paid for. We get paid to do all of this, and this is why you need to go and spend loads of time doing all the maths and all the rest of it. So you can do the physics, so you can do the calculations, so you know the volumes and the parts, so you know material technologies, so you know how to dimension stuff, so you can do a Monte Carlo analysis, um, so you know how to optimise things, so you understand the whole process. Uh, when you do a failure analysis, you need to not only just see that something's failed, but you need to um, work out why it failed, but you also need to prove that it's failed because of that. It's not some other reason that's later on down in another component somewhere that's putting too much strain and stress and uh, you know wear and thermodynamics and you know heat cycles and uh, creep and stress fracturing and all these things. All these things have to come together, and it takes teams of people. It takes teams of people to do this. So there are a lot of guys who've gone on, they've got themselves SOLIDWORKS, they've learned how to use it, they design an engine because they think it's a good idea. It looks like it turns, all the little wheels turn, it looks like it's going to work and all the rest of it. But they haven't done the physics, they haven't done the calculations, they haven't done an analysis, they haven't really considered what they're comparing it to, they're not really taking into consideration costs and what's possible during mass production, so on and so forth. Now don't let me put you off, um, you know, you can design these things, you can build these things, Another good example that I could have used this on was the Wankel engine. You know, they spent a lot of time going round and round this end of the circle before they even started to get to this ended Mazda. You know, it was an awfully long process and it was constantly going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards before they could make an engine that would actually run um, reliably. And that's the problem. It's running reliably with the mass production side of things because your tolerance analysis comes into it an awful lot. And this is what takes so much time and this is why, you know, people, someone asked me how come you can get a thousand horsepower out of a VW Golf engine if you absolutely rag it to its nuts? Or how come dragster engines that use Chevy blocks from the 1960s and 70s can have eight to ten thousand horsepower? It's because it's not, it's not mass production, they're making parts specifically for that that cost an awful lot of money and their reliability is just going straight out the window. They're just literally pushing the engine till it explodes and they generally do. Um, but I hope that makes sense. I hope that gives you an idea of what goes into um, just designing something 
and there's a video coming up shortly where I'm going to share with you a design that I came up with years ago that <laughs> I later found out, this is when I was a junior engineer, I later found out it had already been done and actually been done to death. Um, but we're actually going to see if we can, uh, as, a, as a community, as viewers and me, as we can all come together and see if we can just make this actual thing work um, from a design perspective and then I'm going to actually, I've got the um, Honda engine, the, the C90 engine down there that we're going to do a teardown on. We're actually going to modify the engine to see if I can get this idea that I had back in the day. We're going to actually see if we can actually get it to work on the actual Honda. So that'll be quite cool. Hope this all made sense. As you can see, there's a lot there and there's a lot I haven't covered about it just because I was trying to give you an overview. And um, I'll see you in a bit.